we we have what we have. So we're we're happy with what we have. Okay, so the next unit, guys, is uh, C1 for chemical reactions. C1 for chemical reactions. If you have a textbook, it's chapter eight. And it really is the meat and potatoes of chemical reactions. And my camera is a little wonky. Um, it's the meat and potatoes of chemistry. It's chemical reactions. It's how reactions come together and they do their thing. Is that better? Nope. Oh, well. We'll just go with it. So if you, uh, if you remember your, your basic arithmetic from first grade, 1 plus 2 equals 3. In chemistry, we have an equal sign, but we don't call it equals, we call it yields. So in math, whatever's on the left side of the equal sign equals whatever's on the right side of the equal sign. In chemistry, whatever's on the left side of the yields arrow equals the right side of the yields arrow. So we basically say a reaction is balanced when there's the same amount of stuff on the left as there is on the right. And that's Dalton's conservation of mass. We do not gain or lose mass in a chemical reaction. Mass is conserved in a chemical reaction. Okay. Here's a fun word that you probably have never heard, probably haven't heard in chemistry before. You've probably heard before in the Weather Channel, precipitate. When you're watching the news and they say, there's going to be some precipitation, what do they mean? Rain, something falling out of the clouds. Well, in weather, precipitation is when something falls out of the clouds. In chemistry, a precipitate is something that falls out of the solution or falls out of the reaction. So a precipitate is something that falls out of the reaction. before we jump right in? Okay. There's some lingo and some notation you have to see. Um, but before we talk about the notation, just this is one of those slides that you really don't need to write down everything because it's kind of obvious. I'm going to mention it anyway. The chemicals that do the reacting are placed on the left. The chemicals that get produced are placed on the right. So we say the chemicals that do the reacting are called reactants. And the chemicals that get produced are called products. And the arrow is red, yield. So we say reactants react to produce products. Or reactants react yielding products. Products on the right. Reactants on the left. Just like we read from left to right, chemical reactions proceed from left to right. probably wondering why I'm wearing this get up. Because we are going to make smoke outside. And as great as today is going to be, tomorrow is going to be even better. It's going to be sick. It's going to be sick and tight. It might even be groovy. It was groovy 30 years ago, but now it's going to be sick and tight. Okay, questions before we move on. Okay, now there's some notation that you're going to see that will appear after chemicals. And I was told that writing them on the board during first period got confusing. So I'm going to, I'm not, I'm going to admit them when we're doing our, our samples today. But realize that if you see them, you need to know what they mean. If you see an S after a compound, an S in parentheses, it means that compound is a solid. See an S after a compound, that compound is a solid. Hey, look, the clocks are working. They're moving. How exciting. 3.15 time goal. What do you think? 
think it is if you see a liquid? What letter do you think we use for liquid? Oh. An L. So if you find yourself looking at an L after a compound, it's a liquid, and a gas would be a what? A G. If you find yourself looking at PBI2 with an S after it, that means that solid led to iodide. If you see H2O with an L after it, that's liquid water. Dihydrogen monoxide. And if you find a G after CH4, that is gaseous methane, carbon tetrahydride. So, Gaseous methane, liquid water, solid, led to iodide. And there's one more, which is probably the most common one we're going to use in this class. And that is when something is aqueous. What does aqueous sound like? Aqua. It sounds like what? Water. So if something is dissolved in water and therefore exists as ions, we say it is aqueous. And we write an AQ after it, in parentheses. Aqueous means dissolved in water, existing as ions. Yes? So if you have a solid before you put it in, it would be solid. But after it's dissolved, it would be aqueous. Exactly. For instance, we've looked at this a million times where we have NaCl. If you put NaCl in water, it becomes Na plus and Cl minus. These are aqueous. So you could write NaCl aqueous, and that would mean exist as its ions. So NaCl aqueous means exists as its ions. Okay. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me so far. All right. Some older notation that sometimes you still see are arrows placed in the reaction. If you see a downward arrow, it means a precipitate has formed. It's a little bit of extra information. But should you find that yourself doing an internet tutor and you see the arrow, that's what it means. And an upward arrow means a gas is evolved and left the reaction. So once again, pretty old notation. But should you find yourself doing an internet tutor and they use that, you need to know what those arrows mean. And some reactions don't just go on their own. Sometimes they need a special condition to exist before they go. If a reaction needs a special condition, we place it over the yield sign. So if a special reaction condition exists, you place it over the yield sign. And here are three examples. I'll tell you what those examples are here in just a second. The triangle. Now, the triangle is a Greek letter delta, which usually means change in. But for reasons that I don't know, when you place it over the yield sign, it means the reaction had to be heated. So when the triangle is placed over the yield sign, it means it had to be heated, a heated reaction. Do you remember from your biology what a catalyst is? Who 
could raise your hand and tell me what a catalyst does in a reaction? Remember biology? Muscles and cells and things? What does a catalyst do? Nobody? All right, fine. A catalyst makes the reaction speed up. So if a reaction would be too slow otherwise, we use a catalyst to make it happen. In the bottom of your car, in your exhaust line, there's a catalytic converter that's there to make special reactions happen so you don't pollute the planet more than you have to. So if a system needs a catalyst to go, then you write what that catalyst is over the yield sign. And then obviously the third one is the temperature. If a reaction needs to be carried out at a specific temperature, you would write that above the yield sign. Some reactions like to be hot. Some reactions like to be cold. Some reactions like to be right in the middle. I keep looking at the clock. Like, how much time do we have? It's four o'clock. I'm on schedule. I don't know. All right. So, any questions about this stuff? Okay. The bulk of this unit, what you really need to do is balance chemical reactions. Now, balancing chemical reactions is making sure that the left side of the equation is like the right side of the equation, the same amount of stuff. Now, imagine we're going to make go-karts, very simple go-karts. A go-kart is made out of a chassis, that's the body, a motor, and four wheels. If I had four motors, how many chassis would I need? If I had four motors, how many bodies would I need? It's not a trick question. Four. Yeah. How many wheels would I need? 16. You're like, hey, it's, I can do math after all. 16. So if I had four chassis and four motors, I would need 16 wheels. That would be balanced. Okay. There's the same stuff, the big, if I had four motors, four chassis and 16 wheels on the left, I would have four go-karts on the right. All, everything would get used up. That's a balanced chemical equation. Does that make sense? Can you use fractions of wheels? No. Can you use fractions of engines? No. Similarly, we don't use fractions of compounds. We use whole compounds. So to use whole compounds, we put a big number in front called a coefficient. Now, I wrote rules up here, but really there's only one rule, and then there's three hints. The first rule is you cannot change the compound. In other words, you can't change these subscripts. This is hydrogen sulfate. It has to stay hydrogen sulfate. You can't change a wheel into an engine if you need more engines. Well, I need more motors. I'm going to turn that body into a motor. Can't do it. In a simulation we're going to do later, we're going to, we're going to make sandwiches with bread and bologna and cheese. And if you run out of bologna, you can't turn the bologna into cheese. Or you can't turn the cheese into a bologna. Okay. So you can't change subscripts. Because the subscripts in a compound give the compound its identity, so you cannot change them. Okay. That's pretty much the only rule. The rest are hints. First hint, what is this? Sulfate. Sulfate. Yeah, remember the notation we did in December? Sulfate. Okay. So when you see polyatomic ions, like sulfate, or nitrate, or acetate, Balance them as a group together and balance them first. They very seldom break up. In this class, we try to do everything binary, one positive thing, one negative thing. So we want to leave our sulfate as a sulfate. Don't, don't balance it as sulfur and oxygen. Balance it as sulfate. Next hint, 
If you find single elements like H2, oxygen, or just any element, save them for last because those are going to be the easiest thing to balance. If you find yourself stuck because you have an odd number of things, here you have two hydrogens and one oxygen. If you find yourself stuck because you have a compound that's a two and a one, just double it, make everything even. You can always reduce later. A lot of people get really frustrated, like, ah, oh, this thing has two and one, how do I, what do I do? Double it, make everything even, you can always go back and reduce later on. something is balanced. Same on both sides, exactly. The same elements on both sides. Take a look at this. This is what happens when hydrogen reacts with oxygen. A la, oh, the humanity. Remember the blimp? The, blimp? the Hindenburg one? Yeah, it's the inhumanity. Oh, the inhumanity? Oh, the inhumanity. Anyway, when hydrogen reacts with oxygen, it makes water molecules. But this is not balanced. Why is it not balanced? Yeah. There's the same number of hydrogens, two hydrogens, two hydrogens. But oxygen, there are two oxygens on the left, but only one on the right. It's not balanced. However, if we wanted to balance it, we would add coefficients, whole numbers in front of the compound. I would put a 2 in front of my water molecule, giving me two oxygens, and balancing the oxygen. But by balancing the oxygen, I unbalance the hydrogens, so now there are four. Nod your head if you can see there are four. Okay. So I would need four over here, two times two. So I would put a 2 in front of the hydrogen. Yes. Why is it losing its other oxygen? I'm sorry? Why is it losing Oh, that's the that's point, is this is not balanced. Okay. This is. Right. Bad, good. Okay. Where we start, where we end. No points, full points. F, A. Dummy, smarties. Okay, here we go. Moving on. <laughs> no, I appreciate the question. Um, let's move on. Okay, now, we've talked about the diatomic molecules a million times. We're going to talk about them again. Remember Brinkelhoff? There are certain chemicals that we call diatomic molecules that are never alone. Okay. So, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, ox hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or the Brinkelhoffs, you never see them alone. you have seen this a million times, but there they are, Brinkelhoff. If you don't want to learn this, sit up front, get the poster right there. So look at this. If we were to write the decomposition of water molecules, which we can do, you can do it too. You just take a car battery and put it into a fish tank. Bubbles will come up. The fish will not be comfortable. But anyway, um, I used to do it in here, but it took so long to actually get anything. Bubbles took so long, I just forget about it. So H2O breaks down into two H's and one O. Is this a balanced chemical reaction? No, because of oxygen. Oxygen must be O2. So we would need to write it instead of, instead of H2O goes to 2H plus 1O, we would need to write it this way. We would need to balance it with an O2, with an O2 because O does not get written alone. 
O is diatomic. It's the A in Brinkelhoff. So it cannot just be O. Okay. Give me a thumbs up if this concept makes sense to you. Looks like about two thirds of you. I'm going to call that good. No, it looks like we have about five, six. We're good. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to balance some equations. And I got some chemicals up here. I'll go outside and make lots and lots of smoke. the wind will stay constant. It blew back in our faces very the wind. There are hundreds of thousands of reactions. Nobody's memorized them all. There are hundreds of reaction types. Nobody's memorized them all. We're going to think, we're going to learn about the first five, the five most basic reactions. The most basic reaction of the five is when we take something and we make something new. We take elements and we make a compound. What do we call it when we make something new? A synonym of create. Could you give me a synonym of create? Produce? Make? Okay. Form? Excellent. Anything else? The one I'm thinking about, you learned in, in biology, and it starts with an S. Light comes down, reacts with carbon dioxide and water, makes a carbohydrate. What do you call that when you make synthesis? Synthesis, exactly. So synthesis, yeah, you can dab if you want. Synthesis is the most basic type of chemical reaction, sometimes also called composition, but synthesis is the proper name. And in the synthesis, we take two things or three things, and we make one thing. Some are easy, some are not so much. Now, I'm going to be preparing this reaction while we're doing other things, because it takes time. But the first reaction we're going to do Fun synthesis reaction. We're actually going to do two at the same time. Okay. Uh, when you say, oh, that smells like fibers, what you're probably smelling is, uh, is this reaction. Zinc metal, and if it's okay with you, I'm not going to write the S's because they end up looking like five. And they're like, it's a solid. Zinc solid plus sulfur, and sulfur is weird. Sulfur gets an eight. It's not diatomic, it's octatomic. It's strange. Here we go. So zinc and sulfur make a compound called zinc to sulfide, also a solid, which would be released as smoke. Is this a balanced chemical reaction? No. Because there are eight sulfurs on the left and only one on the right. So how might we balance it? Put an eight over here. Can I put an eight over here? No. no, always in front. Once we have the compounds we need, we don't change those compounds. So eight in front, now we have eight sulfurs just like we have over here. But we unbalance the zinc. How do I rebalance the zinc? Put an eight over here. Now it's a balanced chemical equation. The thing you need to do at the end of every balancing is say, eight zinc, eight zinc, eight sulfur, eight sulfur. Make sense? Now, that reaction requires high temperature to get going. So, to get it going, I'm gonna take some magnesium, metal magnesium, a little metal strip, and I'm gonna react it with oxygen and it's going to produce a white powder called magnesium oxide. I would like you to balance that, please. Hello? Testing, testing. Not a test. It's the first day. You, if you 
you want to do some, there are techniques where you can write multiple times. I just write in arrays and write in arrays until I get the numbers I need. This is the sulfur, and I'm adding 32 grams of sulfur. Because that's my goal. Oh, a lot of beans. Never get that close. So I added 32.06 grams of sulfur. What's the molar mass of sulfur? 32.06. So how many moles of sulfur could I just weigh out? One mole. Okay. And I'm going to set that aside, and then I'm going to add some zinc. Now, if I added one mole of sulfur, wouldn't it make sense to add one mole of zinc? Which is what I'm going to do. How much zinc should I add? Yeah. 65.3, so 65.4. So I'm going to attempt to add 65.4 grams of zinc, and that's a lot of zinc. Not close enough. Okay. I don't want to put chemicals back in the bottle because I might contaminate them. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so I got my mole of zinc. I got my mole of sulfur. And I'm going to put them into this device. This, you're going to use next unit. When you do your own chemical reactions, you're going to use this. And this is called a more pour and pastel. Mortar and pastel. <laughs> Fireworks. Okay. If you have balanced this, please raise your hand. I'm not going to call on you. I just want to make sure we're all, we've all done ready to move on. Okay. Um, what did you put in front of the MG? What number? With a show of fingers, what did you put? One, two, three, four. I'm seeing lots of twos. Okay. What did you put in front of the O? Left it as a 1. Okay. Remember, if you see an X in algebra, it's a 1X. So you left it as a 1. What did you put in front of the MGO? Seeing lots of 2s. Okay. So now we ask ourselves, is it balanced? 2MG, 2MG. Not bad. 2O, 2O. And it's balanced. Pretty good. Now this next one, I can't do. I love it, but I can't do because bromine is really, really dangerous. I'm going to show you a video of it. In this one, we're going to take some bromine, which is ba -ba -da -ba, and we're going to add some aluminum. And this is going to make a compound called aluminum bromide. What I'd like you to do is balance this, please. While I grind up our, our zinc and sulfur mixture, you balance that. Are like C's are like oh C and A's are like ooh A's. I wonder if they're gonna use it now. That's what I heard anyway. Okay, so you're balancing this equation while I'm grinding up our outside explosion. Actually, it's not an explosion. It's just gonna be a, a lot. It's gonna be a conflagration. It's gonna produce lots and lots of heat and smoke. If we wrapped it up in paper, then it would be an explosion. Okay, who's done with this? If you balance this, raise your hand. We'll call it good. Okay. 
What number, in a show of fingers, did you put in front of the BR2? See some threes? Okay, three. What number did you put in front of the AL, the aluminum? Seeing a handful of twos? Okay, twos. What number did you put in front of aluminum bromide? I'm seeing more twos, okay. So now we ask ourselves, is it balanced? Three times two is six. Two times three is six. Six bromines, six bromines. Two times one for two aluminums, two times one for two aluminums, and it's balanced. In this experiment, we are going to react liquid bromine with aluminum to make aluminum bromide. That's bromine. First, a layer of bromine is poured into the bottom of a beaker. Bromine has really dark paper. Then, some aluminum yes, pellets and powdered aluminum that, are that placed that on that top of the bromine. The light aluminum pellets and aluminum powder float on the bromine surface. Within a few moments, they begin to react exothermically. exothermically the pellets stay around the bromine surface. Heat out. Yeah. Hot heat out. Here we see the aluminum pellets burning with a bright flame. We also see white fumes of aluminum bromide, a solid which coats the wash glass and escapes from the beaker. Eventually, all the aluminum has reacted. Lifting the watch glass, we can see the white aluminum bromide that has sublimed on the surface, and also aluminum bromide vapor condensing to solid. Here, we are scraping the solid aluminum bromide formed in the reaction. is I have ground up our zinc and sulfur mixture. And uh, we're going to go outside. We're going to put it out the dirt. And I'm going to add to it a piece of magnesium. So the first reaction we're going to do is we're going to light the magnesium on fire. And it's going to react with oxygen, producing white magnesium oxide. And then the flame front is going to go down. And hopefully, it's going to light our zinc sulfide. So we're going to put it in a disposable dish, like so. How come you don't like switch the bottom? Mm -hmm. How come you just don't slide it with the light in? We might have to. Yeah. So you don't have to use the magnesium? Nope. Okay. Now, we're going to go outside. Um, realize you want, to, you want to be upwind as much as possible. Hope you're upwind. Okay. So go outside next to the tree. balanced our sodium and chlorine reaction. Mm. Well, what number did you put in front of sodium? 93. Put a 2 in front of there? What number did you put in front of chlorine? You left it a 1? And what number did you put in front of sodium chloride? 2? Okay. And why is Cl2, not just Cl? Because it's a Brinkelhoff. It's diatomic. Good. 2Na, 2Na, 2Cl, 2Cl. And uh, this is kind of neat. I would love to be able to do this, but uh, I can't because I don't have Sodium metal is heated until it melts and just begins to burn. That's molten sodium. Then it is immersed into the yellow-green chlorine gas. The sodium begins to burn in chlorine with an intense yellow flame. It produces the white smoke of sodium chloride. We are observing the exothermic reaction of sodium metal with chlorine gas, producing the white solid sodium chloride. Afterwards, the glass spoon contains only white solid sodium chloride. Yeah, you could shave that stuff off and put it on your french fries. Okay, so if synthesis is the most basic type of reaction, 
where two things come together to form one thing, the next most basic would be the opposite. Well, the decomposition reaction. In a decomposition reaction, something breaks down. In a decomposition reaction, something breaks down into its parts. Okay, so the first one I'm going to show you, you've already seen before, and that is the electrolysis of water. Electrolysis is chemistry with electricity. So when you run high voltage through water, eventually you'll get hydrogen and oxygen. It'll, bubbles will come up, little tiny bubbles, and you collect them. After an hour, you have enough. I don't do it in this class because it takes too long. But uh, if you were to balance this, one oxygen, two oxygens, just put a two in front of here like we did before, in front of here. What I'd like you to do now is balance these two reactions. This is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide. The stuff that you pour on your skin. You're like, that sounds nasty. Well, it's kind of neat. It breaks down into water and oxygen. And it's really good for pouring on cuts because the oxygen that bubbles up digs out the crud in your cut. Like if you hit the ground, you're like, spray, you got all this dirt and bacteria in there. You pour the hydrogen peroxide in there, the oxygen will bubble up the crud and uh, clean, the, clean the wound. And then this, if we have time, I'll tell you about why this is fun. But this is mercury oxide breaking down to mercury and oxygen. So balance these two while I set up the next example. Raise your hand if you balance the first one. Hydrogen peroxide? Okay, most of you. What did you put in front of the hydrogen peroxide? Two? Okay. Some of you are like, this is so easy, Mr. Byers. It's like you think so. Uh, what did you put in front of the water? A two? Okay. What did you put in front of the oxygen? Nothing. Okay. Two by two is four hydrogens. Two by two is four hydrogens. Two by two is four oxygens. Two times one. Two oxygens here, one times two, two oxygens there, and it's balanced. What about mercury oxide? What did you put in front of the mercury oxide? A two? What did you put in front of the mercury? A two, and what of the oxygen? That's what I want. Now normally, when you put uh, hydrogen peroxide on a wound, it will uh, bubble up from those enzymes in your blood. 
we can goose the system and add a whole bunch of stuff to it and make the system go a lot faster. So. And all this is, this isn't even a chemical reaction so much, or this is just a catalyst. All that's happening is the uh, hydrogen peroxide is just breaking down into water and oxygen, and the water is creating bubbles. Ooh. It's also exothermic, it's nice and warm. Let me show you the electrolysis of water. When a direct current is passed through water containing a conducting salt, water is decomposed at the electrodes. Hydrogen is generated at the negative electrode, and oxygen is generated at the positive electrode. When the electrolysis has proceeded for a time, we know that the volume of hydrogen gas formed is twice that of oxygen. Since the volumes of gases under identical conditions are proportional to the numbers of molecules present, this tells us that there are two atoms of hydrogen in the water molecule for each atom of oxygen. Now that's what you would see if, uh, if we used the Hoffman apparatus and actually uh, split water molecules. You'd see twice as much hydrogen as you would oxygen which the coefficients would support. And here's the decomposition of mercury oxide. This is fun because this was used um, hundreds of, maybe even thousands of years ago. And what would happen is people would get, uh, they, they, rich people would pay these alchemists to stand around their big cauldron of boiling mercury. And at the bottom of that would be mercury oxide. You could dig it out of the ground. And when you heat up mercury oxide, it produces mercury and oxygen. And the oxygen gets into your brain. If you breathe pure oxygen, you get kind of loopy. And the mercury was really fun to play with. And it would make the aristocrats really loopy. And it would give the, the alchemists would give them lots of money. It makes you crazy. So that's what this is. A bunch of rich people would gather around poisonous mercury and pure oxygen, and they'd have a little party. Mercury two oxide, labeled here with a gold fashion name, mercuric oxide, is a red powder. When red mercury two oxide is heated in a test tube, it darkens in color. As the heating continues, the mercury-2 oxide begins to decompose into its elements to give oxygen and metallic mercury. The metallic mercury condenses as silver droplets on the cooler part of the tube, the tube. If we observe the middle portion of the tube, we begin to see the mercury condensing in a ring. And as we move in closer, we see a distinct silver band of mercury. We also note that the mercury oxide is now black in color. We can test for the presence of oxygen using the glowing splint test. As we bring the glowing splint to the mouth of the tube, it reignites. Later, after the tube is cooled, we note that the mercury oxide returns to its original red color. Okay, the last one I'm saving for tomorrow. So you can use the remainder of class to work on your crossword or big map, uh, because the last thing I want to do is uh, a really, really nifty decomposition reaction. But I want to do that before we do combustion. Combustion.